Hi there, it's Miss Larkin speaking from Rosing Valley. Now, I don't, I know I don't actually teach any of you history in the school. I actually teach a number of you RE, but I am in fact a history specialist. So today I'm going to be talking you through um, the Whitechapel murders of 1888 that I know you've been doing lots of work on. And I know that Mr. Cocker has set you some fantastic work to be getting on with in this area. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to share my presentation with you. So you should be able to see it on the screen. And what I'd really like you to do is follow along with me. You can pause this video if you need to, so you can catch up if you need to take any notes, or you can just listen through and hopefully it will really, really help you with the project that you're doing at the moment. So as I said, I'm about to share my entire screen and I'm about to do that now. And hopefully you'll be able to see what I am doing. OK, so as I said, um, hopefully you'll be able to see um, my screen at the moment and it should say year eight Jack the Ripper. And there's my name for you as well. So you've probably seen a familiar um, drawing to this before. And there's so many images of things like this when studying or researching the Whitechapel murders of 1888 or as lots of you may like to call it, the Jack the Ripper murders. Now, there's so much out there online, and I just want to let everyone know that some of the things that you may find aren't always, aren't always entirely reliable and sometimes not even very helpful to you when studying this part of history. So what I've tried to do is collate all the facts for you so that you're using facts within your project and you aren't using something that potentially isn't that useful that you found online. So let's start off with some of the basic information then on what we like to call the Whitechapel murders. Now, we should all know that Whitechapel is an area in East London. And many of you may have been to Whitechapel. It's on the district line. It's not actually very far away um, from Loughton. It's quite easy to get to. And it sits in the heart of East London. Now, we should also know that the Whitechapel murders took place in 1888. 1888 being in Victorian England. Now, when you say Victorian England, lots of people think of poverty, they think of deprivation, they think of unemployment, and they think of quite low living standards. And that was actually largely the case for so many people living in Whitechapel at this time. It was actually widely known as quite a poor and deprived area. Although what was quite interesting about Whitechapel is there were quite a few rich and wealthy people living there too. So it actually created this really interesting place where quite wealthy middle class people were living a few roads away from some very, very poor people. So it made a very, very interesting area. Now, back to the actual story itself. There were five confirmed victims of Jack the Ripper. Please note that word confirmed. There are actually a number of murders before and after the five that we like to say were definitely um, the work of Jack the Ripper. Um, but there's lots of historians who debate over this. Some historians say there were even nine, 10, 11 um, Jack the Ripper murders. But as a consensus, we say there were definitely five that were committed by the same person. Now, there are lots of common attributes among these murders as well. What I mean by that is lots of these murders themselves had many things in common. First of all, they were all women. Um, and I will be discussing with you lots of other common attributes as we go through. Now, fourthly, we should know this as well. The killer was never caught. Um, the name Jack the Ripper itself is a made up name that actually came from the press um, at the time. Um, and we like to call him this because we have nothing else to call him. Um, and you can, you, you know, um, because because we don't actually know who it is. Um, you know, the, the Victorian Metropolitan Police never caught the killer. And the case was left open for many years, but it was never actually solved, which is probably why so many historians are interested in this part of history. Now, I've also used the term police failings, and that is because when many people study this part of history, they like to talk about um, the role that the police had in not catching the killer and a lot of the mistakes that the police made. Now, we've got to be quite fair here because the Metropolitan, uh, Metropolitan Police were not very old at this point. They'd actually only been formed in 1857, so not very long before 1888 when this happened. So there wasn't really a, a wealth of experience there. Technology wasn't where it is today. And the actual environment itself of Whitechapel was so, so difficult to police. So let's not be completely unfair on the Metropolitan Police of 1888. 
And as you can see here, I've used the term environment of Whitechapel. And what I mean is the actual surroundings of Whitechapel. What was it actually like? Now, it was such an interesting area. Lots and lots of windy streets, dark alleyways, etc. Cramped living conditions, very, very overpopulated, full of all sorts of different people from all sorts of different backgrounds, which made a very, very difficult environment for the police to work in. So I thought I'd mention that too. Let's go on to the five victims then. So as we know, there were five confirmed victims of Jack the Ripper, and the first one was a lady called Mary Ann Nichols. Her nickname was actually Polly, so you may have seen that recorded before. Now, her age is a bit of a source of contention. We think she was between the age of 30 and 35, although other sources have said she was in her 40s. Her father had, been, had said that she was 44. There's other reports saying she's 47. So we think she's between the age of 30 and 44. Okay, now she was, and she's known as the first victim, Victim. But as I said, there are actually two other women that were murdered and a few months before that could have also been um, the victims of Jack the Ripper. Now, she was last seen on the 31st of August, so right at the end of August at 2.30 a.m. OK, she was seen by a friend, Emily, um, who she had told that she had to go and get her night's DOS money. Now, DOS money is your money that you would use to pay for a room to sleep in for the night. So she drank it all, which basically means she'd spent it all on alcohol um, and she didn't have any money. So she had to go out and work for that money. Now, we should all know this already, but I will remind you all that all five of the victims of Jack the Ripper were all prostitutes or sex workers, and um, you might want to call them, which meant that which means that they sold their body um, for money. So they did that as a living and they did that basically because they had very little choice. Um, these women were known as fallen women um, in Victorian society because they'd fallen from grace, essentially. So they'd sort of, you know, they'd gone from perhaps a higher position previously where maybe they had a job, maybe they had a husband, maybe they had a family that could look after them. But for some unforeseen for, um, circumstances, they'd fallen from um, that position and had to take upon um, a job that you know, it really, really wasn't um, anything that anyone would um, could see themselves doing um, in this time period. Okay, so really not a very nice experience for, for Mary Ann Nichols. So she knew she had to go and work to go and earn that money. And the last time she was seen, as I said, was at 2.30 a.m. on the 31st of August by a friend, Emily. Um, and she was seen, she said that she was going to return to Flower and Dean Street. And Flower and Dean Street being a really, really famous street um, in Whitechapel and still a very famous street now for lots of tourists who like to take part in Jack the Ripper walking tours where they walk down these streets that they know that these women would have walked down the night that they were killed. So as I said her body was found, it was mutilated so she had cuts on her face, on her jaw and also on her abdomen as well. Um, and unfortunately, it was quite a bloody scene um, when she was found. Um, it caused a massive frenzy in the press. Um, and as you can see, there's a little snippet from a newspaper um, on the screen here um, with a drawing of her body um, in the middle of there. And you can see that. And then there's lots of people surrounding her, um, police, um, detectives, and also even potential um, suspects already uh, but as we know he was never eventually caught so on to victim number two this one was Annie Chapman and um, nickname being Dark Annie now Annie Chapman is a really interesting one because she was actually a part of quite a wealthy family previously until her husband left her um, and she had nothing so the sad story is that back in Victorian England um, if you as a woman um, were left um, by your husband or perhaps your husband died and you were left with nothing and there's actually very little options out there for you unless you had family members that could take care of you now unfortunately for Annie that was not the case um, and she ended up becoming a prostitute in the Whitechapel area now she was last seen um, on the 8th of September just over a week later now she was last seen at 5 30 a.m so very very early in the morning there you can see that um, there's all already common ground between them. They're both prostitutes, obviously both women in a similar age category and also both seen at quite social hours um, in the morning there. Now, she was last seen by a friend called Elizabeth Long um, who, heard them, who heard her talking, um, talking to a man, she said, um, she, she claims anyway. And she was actually heard um, at a street address 
29 Hanbury Street. I'm going to show you a map of all these um, at the end. Now, she was last heard there and she was actually last found um, in that area as well at five, um, you know, just, just a few hours later. Um, and as you can see here with um, Annie Chapman, as I said, as I mentioned earlier, lots of common ground here, um, also found in the Whitechapel area and also mutilated by her killer. So again, um, throat sliced and um, cut to the abdomen. Um, and again, quite a brutal murder um, of this woman. So on to victim number three. Now I've got a little red box on here because it says the double murder because this is Elizabeth Stride. She was the third victim um, of Jack the Ripper, but there was quite an interesting thing about her. She was murdered or last seen and murdered on the 30th of September at quarter to one in the morning. Again, a very, very unsociable hour um, to be out. She was also a prostitute and she was last seen by a friend as well. Um, and the friend had seen them, um, or and a witness, sorry. So a friend had seen something before now and a witness had seen her talking to a man um, near a gateway um, and obviously last seen at this quite unsociable hour. Now Elizabeth Stride um, was found in the early hours of the morning of the 30th of September. What was really interesting about this one was Elizabeth, Elizabeth Stride was not as heavily mutilated as the other four victims. So historians believe that the, the killer must have been disturbed in some way. The killer obviously didn't see the job through, so to speak. Yes, she was dead, but she didn't have the same scarrings on her as much as the other victims did, which is really interesting in itself. Because if you go on to victim number four, um, a lady called Catherine Eddowes, her murder was slightly different. She was found, as you can see, so 12.45 for Elizabeth Stride, and then at 1.35, so less than an hour later, um, Catherine Eddowes was murdered on the same evening or morning um we should say now i want to mention something about Catherine eddowes because um this victim in particular um i am quite interested in she's actually originally from wolverhampton which is where i originate from um, and she made her way to london because again um, she had no choice she thought that london was the best place that she could earn some sort of a living and um, she did become a prostitute unfortunately um, and fell from grace in quite a similar way to Annie Chapman. I've also put a picture of an ear here. And the reason I've mentioned this is because this is quite interesting. So Elizabeth, um, Catherine Eddowes was mutilated. She had a cut, um, cut in her abdomen area as well. Um, but her throat was cut as well, similar to the other victims. But this time, part of her ear was removed as well. That's really, really interesting um, because previously um, there was a letter that had been printed in the press, in the newspapers, now, this letter was famously called the Dear Boss Letter. And in this letter, it stated that, and this, by the way, was from somebody claiming to be the Jack the Ripper murderer. And this person had written that the next victim is going to have their ear cut off. Now, we'll never know who sent that letter. They're known as hoax letters because actually a lot of people became obsessed with this crime. They'd do anything to get in the newspapers, anything to get some form of attention. So we don't, we don't really know anything about the reliability of this letter. But it's quite interesting because the letter stated that the next victim would have their ear cut off and lo and behold, Catherine Eddowes did have her ear sort of mutilated and, and sort of cut off, um, as I mentioned. Okay, so really, really interesting. Again, this happened on the same night as our previous victim, Elizabeth Stride, the night of the double murder. Lots of historians call this the double event. Now, Catherine Eddowes was much more mutilated than Elizabeth Stride was, and it was almost as though the murderer hasn't been interrupted for this one and wanted to then um, get that satisfaction of doing something pretty horrible um, to this woman. OK, the last one is Mary Jane Kelly. I oh, know my photograph's not appearing for this one. Never mind. Um, now, Mary Jane Kelly um, was actually the youngest of all of the victims. She's believed to have been in her mid to late 20s. Now, she was last seen on the 9th of November. So a bit of a gap here um, between this one here in September over a month and this one here in November. Now it gets similar time though, two o'clock in the morning um, was the time of her murder. Now, really, really interesting. Um, again, um, similar um, sort of circumstances, heavily mutilated. Um, and all this took place in an area called Miller's Court in the Whitechapel district. Again, there's some details here about what happened leading up to her murder. And I can let you guys read that 
in your own time because I know I'm running out of time myself. So as you can see here, we've got the five victims of Jack the Ripper. Now, what do they all have in common? Some easy stuff. Um, first of all, all women, obviously. They were all sex workers, prostitutes. They were all in a similar age category. I know that our last victim was, you know, quite quite a lot younger than the others, but in a similar age category. Um, all mutilated um, in some sort of way. Obviously, we know that Liz Stride was sort of an exception um, to a degree there. Um, and all must have had some sort of trust um, in their killer. And we say that because essentially... If these women, obviously a lot of them had gone into dark alleyways and they sort of moved out of their um, sort of friendship area and they they'd taken themselves away with the killer. So essentially we know that the killer must have had some sort of charisma to have talked to these women. Perhaps he was posing as a potential customer to them. They almost have thought he seemed okay for them to walk away with him um, during this time. And that's what we've sort of deduced from this. We can infer that is what I'm trying to um, get at. Obviously, they all took place in Whitechapel and lastly, all during those unsociable hours. And historians have also agreed that all five women uh, would have been under the influence of alcohol. Now, that's not massively surprising, by the, by the way. Um, alcoholism was a huge problem in Whitechapel at this time. You may have heard of something called the gin craze before. Um, and lots of people relied on gin. Many believed it was actually cleaner than water because it had been distilled. Um, so lots of people were under the influence of alcohol. And, um, you know, it's, it's obvious that alcohol could distort people's sort of viewpoints, but it can also make people perhaps more trustworthy than they normally are, do things they shouldn't do. And we know that these women were all under the influence of alcohol on the night that they were killed. Um, so as you can see from the map here, there's a little screenshot of destinations and locations where these bodies were found all in very similar um, territories, um, as you can see. Um, and historians have studied this map extensively. And some historians have even tried to work out where the killer may have lived, um, even just by looking um, at this map. So I really, really hope everyone has enjoyed this. And I hope you've got a lot out of listening to this. As I said, there's loads of stuff out there. Um, on the Jack Ripper and Whitechapel murders. But do be careful um, online because sometimes things can be quite misleading. Um, so hopefully um, the knowledge I've given you is pretty useful alongside all of the stuff that Mr Cocker has provided. Um, thank you very much for listening. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.